This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. The second speaker of this morning is Martin Amon. Uh, he's from the University of Jena and he will introduce you to higher spin gravity. Yeah, thank you very much. So I've chosen this topic, Introduction to Higher Spin Gravity, which seems to be a bit strange. And we will see that it is really a bit strange. But due to recent developments within, say, the last five years, or in particular the last three years, um, it's a very interesting topic because it aims at um, particular questions in string theory and also in ADS-CFT, which we should have asked ourselves like 10 or 20 years ago. And a few already asked these kind of questions really 10 or 20 years ago. So let me start. Um, so first, uh, in this uh, first chapter, which I call introduction, I will briefly explain to you what is higher spin gravity. So I give you a definition. And uh, in particular, I will then focus on the question why higher spin gravity is really interesting. So first, I start with a rough definition of what higher spin gravity is. So higher spin gravity deals with uh, fields which um, have spins which are larger than two. So usually, for example, if you talk about supergravity or gravity or say electrodynamics, then we restrict ourselves to fields which have spin or helicity smaller than two. But in this higher spin gravity theory, so this is by definition, and consistent theory of interacting massless fields with spin larger than two. And so whenever I give you this kind of rough definition, <coughs> we really have to ask ourselves, do I talk about the empty set or not? So is there really such a higher spin gravity theory? So the interesting piece in this definition are the words interacting and massless. So due to the massless nature of our fields, for example, think about engaged fields, it's massless, or the graviton, it's massless. So we have some gauge symmetry or gauge redundancy in our system. And due to this word interacting, we will see that it is necessary in this higher spin gravity theories that even if we talk about fields with spin larger than two, that we have to couple these fields to gravity. And so this explains why I've written down here this word higher spin gravity instead of just higher spin theory. So let me stick to this kind of working definition. And let, let me ask the question, so why the heck are these higher spin gravity theories interesting? And I will focus on two examples. Oh, so there are two possible answers to that question. Those leading to the answer that these are really interesting. So first, we can view these kind of higher spin gravity theories as somehow in between supergravity and string theory. So let me elaborate on this point a bit more. So for example, consider any string theory you, you like. So then we know that roughly the mass squared of the string excitations, which I call M, is 
roughly goes like a natural number, which can be sometimes even negative if, for example, in bosonic string theory, we, we know we have some tachyons, and then um, this uh, can be negative, but it's n divided by alpha prime. So alpha prime is this dimensionful quantity in string theory, which characterizes the string length squared. And so we know, we all know that string theory is complicated. So what we usually do is we consider the limit where alpha prime or the string length goes to zero. And in this limit, we see that the mass squared of the string excitations is pretty large, except if n is zero. So what does it mean? It means if alpha prime goes to zero for small string lengths, we only have to care about the massless stringy states. And usually, these massless string states, they have a graviton in it, like closed strings, Kalbramont fields, dilettons, whatever. You can also have open string excitations. So in the limit alpha prime goes to zero, we describe or we truncate our string theory to say supergravity. Because all the other um, massive string states, they are very, very massive and so we can integrate them out. Okay, so and of course this is an interesting limit and we all work in this limit. But what about the opposite limit? What about if we take alpha prime to infinity? So then if you just look at this kind of rough formula here, then we see at least if we really take the limit alpha prime going to infinity, so if you take now alpha prime being infinity, then the mass squared of the stringy excitations they're all zero. So in particular, then string theory reduces to a theory where we have infinitely many degrees of freedom which are massless and which interact with each other. And usually these stringy excitations have not just spin uh, 0, 1, 2 or like half integer, but they have spin 3, 4, 5 and so on. So the question now arises, really in this limit alpha prime going to infinity, does string theory really then reduce to higher spin gravity? And let me put here a question mark, because this is not clear. I think most of the people in the string community believe it, but it's pretty hard to make this statement precise. And for, um, for a certain set setup, at least Matthias Gabriel promised me that in his lecture series, which is somehow based on mine also, he will show you how, in which sense higher spin gravity could be thought as a limit of string theory. But only in asymptotically ADS space times. Good. So in, in this sense, basically, string theory is basically alpha prime not being zero or infinity. And so if you take the alpha prime going to zero limit, we have super gravity. If we go alpha prime going to infinity, we have this higher spin gravity theory. And now, of course, if we know something about supergravity or higher spin gravity, then we can learn something about string theory. In particular, we know, because if you look at the massless modes, they are described by supergravity, that the theory is invariant under diffeomorphisms. Yeah? Because at least the massless modes, they are described by an Einstein-Hilbert term plus additional matter fields and additional terms. And so this is diffeomorphism invariant. 
OK. So it turns out that this higher spin gravity theory also is diffeomorphism invariant. But in fact, the gauge group is much, much larger. That's a huge gauge group compared to just diffeomorphisms. And because of that, we believe that we can answer, or not, not answer, but we can get a handle, say, on a question which is really important, but which we haven't seriously tackled in the last 10 years in string theory. And this is the question, what are the symmetries of string theory? Okay, if you talk about symmetries of string theory, then either you talk about just the world sheet symmetries, which you all know, or you say, okay, let's just look at the massless modes, then we get supergravity, then we have diffeomorphisms. But as I explained to you, the, the other limit has a much, much larger symmetry group. And so this much, much larger symmetry group might shed really some light on the question, on one of the interesting questions, what are the symmetries of string theory? And so in particular, can we view a part of these symmetries as just the symmetries of this higher spin gravity theory, which are kind of dynamically broken because we introduced this, because the parameter for string theory alpha prime is not infinity, but finite. And I believe that using higher spin gravity theories, that we will make at least partly progress in this question within the next five or 10 years. So this is one of the interesting questions. And in particular, this question is related to another question which we should have asked ourselves in string theory. And this is the question, what are, or what is precisely the space-time geometry notion in string theory? So, of course, what we usually do, we, took, we take the alpha prime going to zero limit, and then we see, okay, this is just a point particle limit of string theory, and then space-time geometry, of course, is uh, described by, say, Riemannian manifolds. So basically, we have a point-like particle, so the string is not extended anymore, but it's point-like, and it just um, basically propagates on a Lorentzian uh, manifold. But if we now think about an extended object, this is not clear. And it's not really clear what really space-time is. So what, what is the notion of space-time geometry? And of course, we are interested to answer these questions in string theory. But even the question, even the answer to that question in higher spin gravity is interesting. And again, I believe if we can tackle spin, higher spin gravity and find there an appropriate notion of spe space-time geometry, we might be able, uh, at least partly, to answer this question also in string theory. So you see um, this interesting point that higher spin gravity is in between supergravity and string theory immediately may give us a handle on these two questions, interesting questions. But this is not the only reason why people study nowadays these higher spin gravity theories. The other reason has to do with the celebrated ADS-CFT correspondence. And Higher spin gravity theories will basically um, give us a handle or on this ADS-CFT correspondence. So basically, there are interesting new dualities.
between higher spin gravity theories, not now in flat space, but in uh, asymptotically ADS space times, and conformal field theories. And in order to show you what higher spin gravity theory might, um, or how higher spin gravity might help us uh, in this ADCFT correspondence, let me uh, consider this one of the most prominent, prominent examples of ADSCFT. And so this is a relation which can be derived from the new horizon limit of these three brains. And the one who found it will be here next week. So please postpone all questions to him. So n equal to four superangles with gauge group SUN and coupling constant T and Mills. So this is dual, and dual means both series are really equivalent. There are two sides of one coin to type to be string theory on ADS5 times S5. And here we also have two parameters, which is the string coupling constant, GS, and we have the length scale, or the radius of curvature of this uh, five sphere S5 or of the anti desitter space which is L. Okay. And really, these two theories are equivalent, so this is a very bold statement, uh, which is very, very difficult to show. So what we usually do is, we don't look at full, the full quantum theory of n equal to 4 superang mills and compare it to the quantum string theory on ADS5 times S5, but on both sides we take limits. So what we usually take is we take here the so-called large n limit, oh sorry, before I talk about the large n limit I should tell you how these coupling constants are related, so it turns out that T young mills squared, or let's say GS, and it now depends a bit in which, uh, what is your favorite book? So uh, GS is just, so either two pi GS is Chiang mills squared, or some people put here in four pi GS squared. And so this relates the Chiang mills squared here and the GS here. And also we can relate the length scale L here to say the quantities on this side. So what I have to take into account, I've, I've got two length scales here. I've got the radius of curvature of ADS space, but of course I also have the string lengths. And so I have the following relation between the length scale of ADS to the power of four divided by alpha prime squared. So this is just four pi GSN, or it could be written as two Young mill squared times n, which is usually also abbreviated with two lambda, where lambda is the top coupling constant, n times g mill squared. Okay, so this is the usual well celebrated ADSCFT correspondence. And now, since both sides are not tractable at all, in full glory detail, let's take some limits. So on this side, Let's take the so-called large n limit. So what we do is, instead of thinking about the gauge group SUN with n fixed, we take n going to infinity, but in such a way that lambda, so this Toff coupling constant, which is Xi Yang squared times n, is fixed. But this implies, so both of them, they imply that if you fix lambda, g young mill squared times m, but take n to infinity, so then g young mill squared goes to zero. And if g young mill squared goes to zero, 
then I just use this equation here. This tells me immediately that Gs goes to zero, which means that um, we only have to consider not here the full quantum string theory on ADS5 times S5, but we just can ignore the stringy loops. And so we just have to look at tree level or classic tree level string theory. Also, again, on ADS5 times S5, the geometry is the same. Okay. Okay. So this is just one limit which we are working in. The other limit, which we usually take, after we've taken that limit, we also take this lambda going to infinity. Okay. So, but this is just one possibility. So if we take lambda going to infinity, then just look at this formula here then L to the 4 divided by alpha prime squared goes to infinity. What does it mean? So this means that the characteristic length scale, the radius of curvature of our manifold, is much, much larger than the string length scale. String scale. So that means that effectively we are viewing the string as a point like particle. And so we shouldn't be surprised that here we end up not with three-level string theory, but just with supergravity. But this is, again, a special limit. And now I take another limit, which might be interesting, in particular because we can do calculations there. What happens, we've taken this large n limit, what happens if you take lambda going to zero? Lambda is now the effective coupling constant, so what, then we can use perturbation theory. But if we take lambda going to zero instead of lambda going to infinity, then the question arises, and so you immediately see what happens. This quantity here goes to zero. So effectively, the string length, the length scale of curvature is much, much smaller than the string length. So the string is extended. It's a huge object. And this, again, could be n equal to 4. As, so this could be just, uh, sorry, higher spin gravity. It's not really shown rigorously. It's just an idea, which might be true. And so this would be correspondent to a perturbative field theory. Of course, this kind of system is not tractable. This has to do because usually gravity theory is in five dimensions, so the higher spin part is really a mess. So what, usually, what people did in the last few years is they uh, looked at simpler toy models in lower dimensions. So instead of looking at higher spin gravity in five dimensions, and it might be dual to a kind of free field theory, like n equal to four superior mills, they go one or two dimensions down. And so there is one example which relates higher spin gravity in ADS4, so one dimension lower. And the question is, what is the dual CFT? And the dual CFT, so it's in three-dimensional, or two plus one-dimensional quantum field theory, is the 3D ON vector model at the fixed point. So this 3D ON vector model has two fixed points, the Gaussian fixed point, the free field theory. And all of us can do any calculation therein or the so-called Wilson-Fisher fixed point. And both fixed points can be described by this higher spin gravity theory in ADS4. Still, this is a complicated theory. At least the counterpart in three dimensions, you will see the equations of motion. They really look ugly. So people started to think about, what about higher spin gravity? in ADS3. 
sorry, I should give you here some reference, I guess. So this nice achievement is due to Tepanov and Polyakov. And to be honest, also, Witten talked about it, so probably I should also take, uh, write down here Witten. And so this was like, like even 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. But then recently, two physicists started to check if this is really true. And so that's why I also want to add their names here. This is John Lee and Yin. OK, so if you're interested in this duality, then you have just to look at their papers. They are very messy, but uh, also very nice results. Uh, OK. If you are interested in higher spin gravity in ADS3, which turns out to be dual to a two-dimensional CFT, and it's a so-called two-dimensional minimal CFT with an extended symmetry algebra. It's not Vera Soro, but it's a so-called WN algebra, or even W infinity. And this great achievement is due to Gabadil and Gopal Kumar. Matthias Gabadil will be here next week. And His talk will be precisely about this duality, and he will focus on the CFT side. So what I will do in the lecture is I will talk about higher spin gravity in ADS3. So the nice thing about these two dualities is that both sides are tractable. So everybody of us can do, at least if we are patient enough, perturbative calculations in 3D and vector models. If you are patient enough, we can also do calculations in higher spin gravity on ideas 4. So we can compute correlation functions. And so we can really check the ADCFT correspondence. But it's more than just checking. Because we know how to quantize and free field theory, we can also ask the question, how does this holographic direction, this radial direction of the anti-sitter space, really emerges from a free field theory? So we can look at like the first principles of ADCFT, why it works. So people really started in order to explore these first principles of ADS-CFT, like why the holographic direction emerges and how it emerges. People really started to look at the so-called renormalization group flows. So it's described by an equation, by the so-called Polchinski equation. There's also another formulation due to Wetterich, so the Wetterich equation. People really started to think about, can we formulate these Archie flow equations in, in a higher spin gravity? So, for example, Ivo Sachs, which is a professor here in Munich, did it, or started with it, also people before, before him, and now um, there are two nice papers by Rob Lee from this year. But people really think about these issues, and in particular how the holographic direction emerges. Um, but here, both sides are tractable, as I told you. So there's another possibility, or another question, which we can tackle now. And this is not the question about the field theory side. Usually, we talk about this side. Uh, we talk about n equal to four super mills, and we want to find something out about strong coupling of n equal to four super mills, and we translate it to a supergravity calculation on ADS5. So classical calculation. So, but we can also turn it around. We can ask the question, and this is a very important question, what do we learn from ADCFT about quantum gravity? Suppose I do just a perturbative calculation on the field theory side and I know how to translate it to the quantum gravity or to the gravity side. What do I learn about quantum gravity? 
So the problem is that it's not really clear which questions to answer or how to translate interesting questions from the gravity side to the field theory side. So we really have to work more to find out more about this mapping between the two sides. And whenever I write down here quantum gravity, I mean the quantum gravity aspects, of course, of string theory. Because this ADC of T duality, it's very crucial that there is a string theory here because also we have um, states with um, conformal dimension um, which um, are not just of order one, but scales in a different way. So they are really correspond to string states here. So what can we learn about quantum gravity, about string theory? And so my dream is, my personal dream, that I really want to understand something. I really want to understand why black hole creation or black hole formation in this process and evaporation is really a unitary process. Let me remind you that Hawking said it's not a unitary process because of the information loss paradox. And later on he gave up. And then he had to buy a dictionary or some Brockhaus or whatever, an like encyclopedia, and had to give it to, uh, I think it was Susskind, because he, Susskind said it has to be unitary. Why did he give up? Why did Hawking give up? And so this was due to ADCFT. Yeah, so, so the reasoning is, okay, so we have an, some setup in ADS, so black hole formation and creation, in principle, we can translate this process to the CFT side. In the CFT side, the time evolution is unitary. So a pure state has to end up in a pure state. And so then we go back to the gravity side. We have to end up with a pure state and not with a mixed state. And that's why it has to be unitary. But to be honest, I think it's true. It's unitary. But I think it was a bit too early that Hawking gave up. Yeah, whenever such a famous person gives up, then people um, stop bothering about it and thinking about it. That's not good. So it's, my dream is really, at least in this tractable toy models, we can describe this process of blockade formation and um, uh, annihilation or evaporation. And then we can study whether this process is unitary. And even we can study like local things about the horizon, what happens at the horizons? Are there any firewalls or not? Or, yeah. Why is this so semi-classical argument of Hawking wrong? And I think this should be motivation enough to study these higher spin gravity theories. So the ADCFT part and the string part. Because you see, it's you can really ask deep questions, which you may not be able to answer in full glory detail in this high spin gravity, but at least you get a hint on it how it looks like in string theory. Okay, so now we have to answer the question, what is really higher spin gravity? And in my definition, I want to weaken now one point I want to weaken this point about interacting massless fields. So first look at free fields. And this is chapter two of my lecture. And after chapter two, I will give you basically an outline of what I will continue to do. So chapter two is about formulation of free higher spin theories. And now, because there are free theories, it doesn't have to couple to gravity. So that's why I don't write down higher spin gravity, but higher spin theories. And I also want to weaken another point. First of all, just to make it a bit simpler in the beginning, this word massless. Let's look at the massive case. Even the massive case is interesting. Okay, so 
what is a spin S massive field? So what we have to do is that this corresponding one particle state to this massive higher spin field has to carry a unitary and irreducible representation of the Poincaré group. That's what we know and what we learn in quantum field theory. And so how to do this for the higher spin theories? So this study was initiated by Fierce and Pauli and in 1939. So it's a pretty old, pretty boring subject. So what are the spin S massive fields? So Fierce and Pauli just wrote down the field content and the equations of motion. They didn't bother about a Lagrangian formulation. So they said that the higher spin field, and I used now this phi here, so not the var phi of Latte, but this one here. And later on, I will also use the var phi, so just make sure that you can distinguish it. And so a higher spin field, like a spin zero field and scalar field has no index, and spin one field and gauge field has one index, and spin two field has two indices, so what about a spin S field? Now, okay, it should have S indices. And this higher spin field should be symmetric in this indices. Moreover, Fierce and Pauli wrote down the equations of motion, and they look pretty simple, as simple as possible. And of course, we can immediately write it down for a scalar field, so then it's just depends on a bit on your definition of uh, or your convention for a scalar field it's just box minus m squared box the d'Alembert operator is acting on phi zero for a spin s field they just conjectured okay let's add some indices and let's put it to zero however such a field if you look at such a field um, it carries spin S, but also it carries lower spin. So you have to, in addition, you have to add another condition, uh, condition which is a kind of transversality condition of this form here. And we will explore, really, how to impose this condition. We say just that the divergence, so d mu1 of phi mu1 to mu s is equal to zero. And of course, because the phi is symmetric in the indices, this is not only true for the first index, but you just can permute it. OK. So still, that's not all, the whole definition of Pauli and Fierce. It turns out that now we have a unitary representation of the Poincaré group, but it's not irreducible. OK, so if you think about the graviton, then we also say that the graviton um, should be symmetric in the indices. G mu should be symmetric. But the graviton should be the traceless part of it. And this is important because then you just get the helicity two states. And um, so what we have to do is we have to impose the condition, so the so called trace condition, that eta mu1, eta mu2 times phi mu1 up to mu s is zero. And these basically were the so-called pauli fears or fears pauli conditions or equations of motion. Okay, And they just come from the statement, um, which you learn in quantum field theory, that this corresponding one particle states have to carry a unitary irreducible representation of the Poincaré group. Okay. So, but we are physicists, so we are not used to think about just equations of motion. What we want to do is we want to write down a Lagrangian or action principle. So the question is, is there a Lagrangian formulation of these e equations? And the answer is yes, but 
So Pauli and Fierce found this here in 1939, and the corresponding Lagrangian formulation was found in 1974. So there's a huge time, or a lot of time passed between people find the Lagrangian formulation. And so, so this is due to Singh and Haken in 1974. Okay, so what's the problem? Why does it, why, why does it take like yeah, more than 30, 35 years to write down a Lagrangian formulation? The problem is that you have, you need auxiliary fields. Like if you want to write down the Lagrangian formulation for a spin S, higher spin theory, then what you need is your, you need auxiliary fields with spin s minus two, s minus three, s minus four, s minus five, up to down to spin zero, which you have to add to your Lagrangian in order to get these equations here. And at the end, if you really want to write down these equations, you have to set all these auxiliary auxiliary fields to zero, so in order to write down the field e equations. Okay, and this is what we really want to explore now. How does it work? And let me start with the simplest possibility. Let me start with spin one. Of course, the spin one is a bit um, obvious or trivial because I told you for spin S fields we need auxiliary fields which have spin S minus 2, S minus 3, S minus 4 and so on. So for spin S equal to 1 field, of, of course there's no auxiliary field with spin S uh, minus 1, just minus 1. Yeah. So um, we don't need auxiliary fields at all. Okay, but just to explore a bit the structure, let me write down the Lagrangian and just to see how it works. So the Lagrangian is very simple. It's just of this form. And let me remind you the field should be massive. So this is just the Lagrangian which uh, Singh and Hagen wrote down. I think even like people beforehand, even Pauli and Fierce wrote down the um, spin one part. Okay, so what do you do if you have a Lagrangian, so you're interested in the equations of motion? And the equations of motion, it's the so-called Proca equation, is given in this form and um, you can check it, it's uh, not very difficult. Okay. Good. But of course, now just compared to what Pauli and Fierce wrote down, these are not the equations Pauli and Fierce had in mind. Because this equation is just dollar bear minus m squared of phi mu has to be zero, and there should be not such a term here. So what we do now, and this is really a trick which we have to do for all these higher spin theories, what we do now is we take the divergence of the equation of motion. In other words, I dot the whole equation by, say, a d mu from the left. And if I dot it from the left with d mu, so I've got here a d mu box phi mu. Box is just something like um, d rho squared, or d mu squared, or whatever. And here, if you um, also uh, act with d mu, as an upper index mu, um, from the left, then what you have here, you also have here box times d rho phi rho. So in principle, you've got here the same terms, they drop out, 
and you are left with this term um, acting with d mu from the left. Of course, m squared is constant. So then you end up with d mu phi mu being zero. Nice. This is the this condition here. Very nice. Good. And if we put it back into our equations of motion, then we see this term is zero, and then we see that box phi mu minus m squared phi mu is zero, which is precisely the equation which was written down by Pauli and Fierce. Good. So this is the spin one case. So the lesson to remember is don't just look at the equations of motion, also think about dotting it with a partial derivative set, like looking at the divergence, for example. Okay, let's look at this next example, spin two. And let's start with a naive guess. Naive guess because the rule I told you is that we have in spin s field, then we also have auxiliary fields with spin s minus two. So if s is equal to two, we expect that we have a scalar auxi auxiliary field, which we have to add. So this is the first time where we have to add auxiliary fields, and we will see why we have to add them. Okay, so let's just write down Lagrangian. L spin one. Okay, so we need something like this, but now uh, our object, because it's in spin two, um, should have two indices. So I just add here, okay, and, and row index here, and I have to contract all the indices. So this is just the analog of this term. Here, this is just a divergence term, where I'm not, uh, I don't want to fix here this constant here. I just write it down in this way. Um, let's see. So this has one free index mu, which I also have to contract. And here, of course, I can't use mu again, so I have to use a different index. Let me write it down in this way. Yeah, so this object has a free index mu, this object has a free index mu, and so here I've contracted with mu, and here I call it rho. And this is alpha, it's just a constant, yeah, which we later on will set to a certain value. And then I've got, I have to add a mass term. So this is easy, m squared half times n phi mu nu phi mu nu. Okay. Again, I assume that phi mu nu is, is symmetric and traceless. This is what I built in from the beginning. Those conditions were obvious, of course, for the spin one example. Okay, good. So, how do the corresponding equations of motion look like? And let me write down. So, the, e the equations of motion are easy to derive. So if you want, you just have to sit down for your own. And if you have questions, then just ask me. So this are, so this, has, this object now has two indices, so mu and nu. Of course, this object here, phi mu nu, is symmetric in mu and nu. So that's also why I have to symmetrize this object here. In other words, I have to interchange mu and nu. Then I've got this. Um, And so this term is a bit odd because d appears, with, which is the dimension of space-time, which we assume to be larger than two in the following. And this comes because we've manipulated a bit the equations of motion already, and we've used the fact that phi mu nu is traceless. So d is the dimension, and should be larger than two. For, for this here, for this step, it doesn't matter. Um, but so, so this is the equation of motion. Just the lesson we learned 
um, from um, the example for the spin one case, what we have to do is we have to take the divergence of it. Oh, yes? No, it should be, should be, this should be massive unitary representations for the Poincaré group. Okay. Ah. So then the little group is different. Okay, okay. good. So, so this is the equation and what I have to do now is I have to dot one of the indices. That was just the trick here. And if I dot one of the indices, so like I contract or I, I multiply this side now with d mu, say this in this way here. So then I end up with the following equation. So one minus alpha half times box d mu phi mu. Okay, probably you have to relabel some of the indices to get this result. Okay, so this is what you get. So I assumed alpha is a free parameter and d is larger than two. So of course you see this equation simplifies if we set alpha to equal to two. And this is what we will do in the following. So this is zero if alpha is two and then this term drops out. However, this term here is if the dimension is not two, is non-zero. Okay, and okay, this term is also still there. So in the spin one case, just by taking the divergence of the equations of motion, we just got this transversality constraint. But here, this is the transversality constraint, so this should be a partial derivative. Uh, it looks like a J, sorry for that. Okay, so um, we cannot really extract this one because this term is non-zero in general. So we are stuck now. Okay, we cannot get this transversality constraint. So the question is, can we make sure that, say, this second derivative acting on phi rho sigma, such a term, um, is really zero? And this is what we really want to achieve. But let's now remember that we still have an auxiliary field. And the auxiliary field is pi. So well, I call it pi, it's just a scalar. So I add another term to the Lagrangian. And this term, the only purpose for this term is to make sure that the second derivative, so d rho d sigma phi rho sigma is zero, and if this is zero, and such an equation still holds, um, which is slightly modified, but nevertheless, um, then you get the transversality constraint. So in order to impose now this transversality constraint, we have to add this auxiliary field. And so what we add is it's just a Lagrange multiplier, or almost a Lagrange multiplier, in, um, but it's also dynamical. It also has a kinetic term. Usually the Lagrange multipliers, they don't have a kinetic term. So we've done Lagrange multiplier, we just, would have just to write down such a term. But here it's more convenient also to make it uh, dynamical. by adding, and also give it a mass, by adding these two. Terms to the Lagrangian and C1 and C2 are just constants, which we will fix later on. So what you see now is that's now a Lagrangian, which is not first order in the derivatives. Then not only first order derivatives appear and like the fields as usual for uh, like all quantum field theories, which we're used to. But here, also second order derivative appears. 
So we have to be a bit careful if we want to calculate now the equations of motion for the combined system L spin 1 plus L pi. So the EOM, the equations of motion for this L spin 1 plus L pi for this phi mu nu for this field looks like the following. And now, okay, in this L spin 1 we have this alpha parameter which I've already set to 2. Okay, so this is what I built in right now. And so then the equations of motion look like the following. 2 minus d times box minus d m squared d mu d mu phi mu nu. Okay, so it's not okay. It's not the equations of motion. Sorry for phi mu nu, and um, but it's uh, so. What we did is we've already took twice the divergence. So here I've, I've taken it once. I've multiplied it by d mu from the left, but also now I also multiplied with d nu. So I've contracted all the indices, and then I get this equation. But nevertheless. Before I can do it, I have to recompute the equations of motion because of this new term here. And this is really what you can check as an exercise. It's, it's really straightforward. So this is the equations of motion for a phi mu nu and contracted with d mu d mu. And the equation of motion for, phi, uh, for pi is given in the following form. It's in d mu d nu phi mu nu plus 2 times c2 minus c1 box pi is equal to 0. So these are the two equations of motion. And from these two equations of motion, we should now get somehow this transversality constraint. Okay, so what's the strategy now? So first, let's look at it a bit more closely. So these are two homogeneous linear equations, and somehow the variables are d mu, d nu, phi mu nu, so this piece here, and say pi. And this box word I just it's, of course, I know it's an operator, but I've just uh, put it into the coefficient. And of, when does such a linear system have only the trivial solution that pi is zero, oops, sorry, here is, and the other uh, independent uh, variable, namely d mu d nu phi mu nu is zero? So when, so this system only has this trivial solution if the determinant does not vanish. So let's calculate now the determinant. Okay, so it's really straightforward. I have just to multiply this piece here with this piece here minus this piece here with the one, okay, one times with the one here. Okay, so this is if you we've written this as a matrix equation, then this is the determinant. And so you end up with the following one. So you end up with a term which has no box in it. So this is precisely at C. This is precisely this term multiplied with this term here. C2 times d man, dm squared and with a minus 2 in front. Then you end up with a term which has just a box in it. So this is, for example, this term with this term. And then you end up also with terms which have a box squared in it. And
Okay, so this is your determinant. If you are, if you just treat your coefficients or your box, if you treat them as the coefficients. And now what we want to have is that this determinant is non-zero, and because we don't know what really box or box word means for this operator, it should be better algebraic. So in other words, we hope that we find a solution where this coefficient is zero, this coefficient is zero, but this coefficient is non-zero. If we find such a solution, then the determinant is non-zero. Let me remember you, uh, remind you C1 and C2 are constant, so we can choose them. And this is really possible, so what we have to do is we can now put C1 as d minus 1 divided by 2 d minus 2. And this is precisely the value. Um, so if you look at the Lagrangian, which I've written down where? Oh, here. So C1 is just the coefficient in front of the kinetic term. And this is always the value which you see in this higher spin fields. And precisely the reason is that um, this coefficient here has to vanish. And C2 we can choose as d times d minus 1 m squared divided by 2 times d minus 2 squared. And if this is true, then the two coefficients here, they are zero. And then we end up just with delta being minus two c2 times d times m squared. This c2 value is not equal to zero. So we also end up with delta not equal to zero. So the determinant is, does not vanish, which implies, and let me use this space here, which implies that the two independent variables have to be zero. So pi has to be zero, d mu, d nu, phi mu nu has to be zero. And so then we go back to my first transversality condition, alpha is equal to two. So let, just look at the second line on this very right blackboard. And then you see, because, okay, in this term, d rho, d sigma, phi rho, sigma is zero, and the first term is zero because alpha is equal to two. Then you see that m squared times d mu phi mu nu is zero. And this is precisely the transversality constraint. Okay, now let's put this constraint back into the equations of motion which were on the first, very first line, pi is zero, so this, uh, this term of the L pi, so the pi d mu d nu phi mu nu doesn't contribute at all. And so what you see then that the equations of motion, okay, so these are the ones in the round brackets with, without the d mu in front. The equations of motion are then just box minus m squared acting on phi mu nu being zero. Nice. So what you've seen is we have now a Lagrangian formalism for a massive spin two field. So what we have to do is we have to set alpha to two, C1 and C2 to these values, and then we are done. And we've also, also seen why this scalar field, this auxiliary field is important and that we have to set it to zero at the end. It is important because it precisely gives us this constraint here. And this story continues also for higher, massive higher spin fields, for spin three, four, five, okay? So from spin three field, you have, would have here three indices, and then you have to make sure that d mu, d nu acting on phi mu nu rho has to be zero, and d mu, d nu, d rho acting on phi mu nu rho has to be zero. So you have two constraints which you have to somehow build in, and for these two constraints, you need a spin one auxiliary field and then spin zero auxiliary field. So this is the story for spin three. And it continues for spin four, you need a spin two, spin one, and spin zero auxiliary field, which at the end, all of these auxiliary fields at the end have to be set to zero. Okay, so this is the picture behind. Okay, good. So, Let's now take, or let's consider now not the massive case, but the massless case. 
So what we can do is we can just take the limit m going to 0 in this case. So let's look at the spin 2 case and let's take this m going to 0 limit. So did I... Okay, I call it 2.1 is the massive case, so 2.2 is then the massless case. And so this analysis is due to front star, also not like just for the spin 2 case, but for all higher spin cases. And this was done in 1978. Pretty old stuff. But the lesson is if you want to be successful in string theory, then you should know the literature also from the 70s. Good. Or at least know somebody who knows the literature. OK. So what we do is now we take L spin 2 plus L pi and take the massless limit. And if we do this, then um, we end up with the following Lagrangian. And just let me write it down because um, you will realize that you've seen this Lagrangian beforehand. So in principle, also the analysis due to front style for the massless case, this one is pretty old. So, so who has seen this kind of Lagrangian? Okay, so if you really stare at it, then you will see, okay, I have to do a field ref definition, but then I've seen it. So let's take the following field redefinition. And now I use this var fee, which is again symmetric in mu nu, but which is not constrained otherwise. It's not traceless. So what I do is I add to phi mu nu the following term, and eta mu nu times pi. And here the prefix that I chose to be 1 divided by d minus 2. So this implies that, OK, phi mu nu is, of course, symmetric in mu nu, as you can check. And it's not traceless. And if you do this, and this is a good exercise, it's a good exercise because it's, you have just to do it on a piece of paper. So on a blackboard, I guess it's, it's not good. You would see that I cannot calculate anything on a blackboard. OK, so it's, now it's always the var file. So phi rho rho just means this is the trace part, and phi sigma sigma is also the trace part. So this is the kinetic term for the trace part. This is the kinetic term for the full part. This is um, somehow an interaction piece. And then we have also the trace part coupled to a second derivative. And such a piece you've already seen somewhere, namely when you linearized your Einstein equations around flat space-time. That's precisely the term which appears, in which you always think, oh, this is a nasty term. So basically, if you just, if you write down your Einstein action, like 1 divided by 2 kappa squared times uh, integral squared minus g times r, and if you now say g, g minu is something like eta minu plus kappa, yeah, we would call it h minu or 
phi menu, so this is really your h menu, so your fluctuations around the flat space time, then you would discover this Lagrangian here. And so the equations of motion of that Lagrangian, and I've just write them down because it's then it's straightforward to generalize to spin three. The equations of motion can be written in this form, so it's an f mu nu, which is just a box phi mu nu. minus d mu d rho phi rho nu plus of course the symmetrized version plus d mu d nu the traceless part and this has to be zero. So first what you see is the equations of motion again are second order so in particular this term uh, can be rewritten. Um, and so these are the equations of motion which are straightforward to generalize later on. And what you also realize if you look at this Lagrangian or the corresponding action is uh, besides the equations of motion there exists a gauge transformation and we know what the gauge transformation is, namely this is the infinitesimal version of diffeomorphisms acting on this field phi mu nu, which is something like the metric. The delta of phi mu nu for this gauge transformations could be written as d mu, we would call it as an gr person and epsilon nu, but uh, so the higher spin people always call it lambda. So lambda nu of x is something like the parameterizing the gauge transformation, and this is really an infinitesimal diffeomorphism. So we recovered just spin two gravity, or that linearized gravity. Okay, good. So what I try to do now is I try to generalize these two equations, and that's why I've written down them. And that's what Fronstall did. Generalized these two equations to spin three. So what you do for spin three, a massless spin three field, still and free field, because in this chapter we just deal with uh, uh, free fields, we could, we've write down now this in terms of this phi, var phi, with three indices, and this var phi is uh, not constrained now, in particular it doesn't have to be traceless. Okay, so basically this trick that I can couple, or that, that I can combine the dynamical field with the auxiliary field also works for the higher spin um, theories, and we now straightforwardly basically generalize these two equations here. Okay, so we have got an f mu nu row with three indices. So this is just a box acting on phi mu nu rho. And then we have got this piece where basically one of the indices has one of the, uh, one of the indices is basically just a partial derivative. And then we take the phi which we dot with a derivative. So the corresponding generalization to um, spin three is then given by such a uh, term. So it's a d mu times that's, now I can't use the row here because it's still an, already an index here. So it's a d mu d sigma of phi um, nu rho sigma. So that's also, um, or sigma nu rho is symmetric in the three indices. And then here we have cyclic permutations 
in the indices mu, nu, and rho. Okay, also here we symmetrized uh, mu and nu, so you can also view it as a cyclic permutation of mu and nu. Now we have to write down the analog of this one here. And this could be written as d mu, d nu, phi sigma, sigma rho, plus again the cyclic permutations. So this is my f mu nu rho. And the front style equations just imply that these are zero. So these are the front style equations. That's just a generalization of what we've written down here to this case here. And this is really corresponds to then a spin three field, a massless spin three field, um, which because it's massless, we also have this gauge uh, redundancy. So we can act with a gauge transformation on phi. And if we act with a gauge transformation on phi, so this phi mu nu rho then changes as um, d mu lambda nu rho plus cyclic permutations in mu nu and rho. So these are three terms like um, and d nu lambda mu rho and, and d rho lambda mu nu. Okay, so these are the two missing terms which I have not written down. So this is really a gauge transformation. And of course what we want to have is, because that's the equation of motion here, that this object f mu nu rho should be gauge invariant. So this is better what we should check. Okay, so what we do in order to check this is, so delta f mu nu rho is just box of delta phi mu nu rho minus, and then we act with delta on this piece here and with delta on this piece here, and we are careful and bring everything together. We use this gauge transformation. And what we realize then is that it's not zero, but it should be gauge invariant. So how does it look like? So under gauge transformations, so this delta f mu nu rho transforms as in three times d mu d nu d rho times an lambda sigma sigma, so where I contract both of the indices of my gauge parameter. So these are not good news. F mu nu rho is not gauge invariant. But what we can do is we can say, okay, then just use those gauge parameters, lambda mu nu, which are traceless, because then this lambda sigma sigma is zero. So eta mu nu times lambda mu nu should be zero. Okay, so this is a constraint. This is why the front style equations are considered to be not nice, yeah? because this is a very unusual constraint. We want to get rid of this constraint. Okay, good, so this is the generalization to spin three, and I guess I don't have to bore you. It's now really straightforward to write down um, this spin three front star equation to a spin S front star equation. Okay, so what we have to do is instead, so you have to add another index or several other indices to your five field then you have to take into account that you have to take here the cyclic permutations of all the indices and also here. But it's then the same equation. 
So generalization to spin S, which is larger than 4, is straightforward. So I don't write down now how this f mu nu rho sigma for spin 4 looks like and how this gauge transformation looks like. It's always important for these cases that again the gauge parameter, which now has in the case of spin 4 has three indices, in the case of spin 5 has four indices and so on, is always traceless. That's always important for all the higher spin cases. Okay, and this is because Delta uh, F mu nu rho, also with more than three indices, has to be gauge invariant. Okay. So, another question is, so far we've, we've dealt just with equations of motion. Can we write down a Lagrangian? And this is possible, and this is, was also shown by Fronstal in this paper by 1978. And to be honest, the Lagrangian looks pretty simple. So the Lagrangian is just 1 half 5 mu 1 to mu s. So for spin s field, we have s indices. And this doesn't have to be traceless. Also, this f has s indices, and now we just have to con contract a few indices. So we have right down here an eta mu 1 mu 2 times an f mu 3 until mu s lambda lambda. OK, so this is just the Lagrangian. It's very, very simple. Of course, in this f, we have for example, a term like box phi mu 1 to mu s. So this term here with the corresponding term with the box term here is just the kinetic term. And so on. So you can write down, um, write it down now if you replace just f by its definition, then you have the full Lagrangian. However, there's an, another slight subtle point. And the subtle point is that um, if you vary the Lagrangian, if you do it explicitly, then you realize that in order to obtain these equations of motion, that you also have to impose that this field phi, which is symmetric in the inset but not traceless, is so-called double traceless. So to obtain the equation of motion, we have to demand that if we contract two indices, if we multiply, say, if you look at such a term, and this also applies to spin large or equal to four, so not to the cases which I've shown you, that this is zero. So in other words, a massless higher spin field is symmetric in the indices and is what people call double traceless. So double traceless just refers to this condition here. And furthermore, the gauge parameter has to be also traceless. And then the equations of motion are pretty simple. It's just that this f, which appears here, has, is zero. So this is really the higher spin um, formulation of the whole story. So now a question arises. What about these nasty constraints here or for the gauge parameter? Can we get rid of them? And long time people thought that this is not possible because you can count the degrees of freedom and so on. In particular, like, let's look at the spin 3 case. 
there we haven't had such a problem with the double tracelessness, but we had the problem that the gauge parameter had to be traceless. So what we can do is we can now modify a bit the equations of motion to build also this kind of uh, constraint into the equations of motion. So this was done uh, in a nice work by uh, Sagnotti in 2002. But what it means is that the theory is non-local. So if we want to give up these constraints, then we end up with a non-local theory, while this theory here, so this field is at, evaluated at x, this field is also evaluated at x, and so on, this is local. It contains more than two derivatives, more than one derivative in the Lagrangian, but it's, it's local. Okay, so this is just one com uh, uh, comment on this. And now the question really, the question is, so these are free field series. What about interacting field series? And the nice thing is, which I should review in the beginning of the next lecture shortly, is that there are a lot of no-go theorems. Basically saying there is not such a higher spin gravity theory in flat space-time. Or if it exists, then it has to be short-ranged. But the, So now the question is, okay, this is a little bit puzzling because we believe that string theory also in flat space and reduces to high spin gravity theory, but according to uh, a no-go theorem, this should not exist. So is there a way out? And we don't know yet. But we believe though because we have an example. Another way is to get away from just flat space-time conditions. And let's look, say, at anti-de-sitter or de-sitter space-times. And then all these no-go theorems, they don't um, apply. And so that's why I want to restrict on higher spin gauge theories than later on in ADS. Because we definitely know they exist. We know an example which is consistent, which is interacting, which we can write down. So, and we don't talk about the empty set. Okay, but more details next time. Good, thanks. No, yes, so it, as I told you, so uh, for the spin two case, this five mu new row was a um, linear combination of this five mu new, which was traceless, and the corresponding um, auxiliary field. And that is also true for this case here, that you package it in. So in other words, you just give up the tracelessness condition. So I, that's why I've written down here, five mu new row is not traceless, but it's still symmetric in the indices. Okay? And if you go to spin larger than four, you have to impose that this field uh, satisfies this double tracelessness condition. Any more questions? 